speaker for this session, Professor Tahu uh, Kukatai is the Professor of Demography at the National Institute of Dem um, Demographic and e Economic Analysis at the University at Waikato. Please welcome Professor Tahu. Ko te mea tuatahi uh, e mihi kawana ki te mana whenua, uh, ko te iwi larakia, uh, ngā mihi mahana uh, ki a koutou mai i tōku whenua o Aotearoa. Uh, ki ngā rangatira o te rōpū nei, uh, Lawicha Kōrua ko Pat, uh, nei rā te mihi atu ki a Kōrua. Uh, ki taku hoa kai kōrero a Bruce, ngā mihi mai o hā ki a koe, hōhunu rau atu tō kōrero, miharo. Ki ngā tāngata, kua huhi mai nei i te ata, hei tautoko, te, uh, te kaupapa, uh, tēnā koutou. Uh, he uri tēnei nō Ngāti Tipa, Ngāti Kino Haku me te ao pauri, uh, nō reira tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā rā tātou katoa. Um, so, just a bit of translation for that. Um, I wanted to begin, as we do in Aotearoa, by acknowledging our home people, uh, our hosts, the Larakia Nation, I wanted to uh, thank the Luwicha Board uh, for crafting uh, such a thoughtful program. You've really given us a lot to work with. Um, I wanted to also acknowledge um, the leadership of your mana wahine, your wise, courageous, and tenacious woman, uh, Luwicha Donahue and, and Pat uh, Anderson. Um, the keynotes and sessions have been really provocative and insightful. Um, Bruce, that was amazing. Uh, I love the way you use colonial sources and Aboriginal sources to flip the narrative uh, so powerfully. Really resonated me, with me. Um, and as a data geek and a wannabe historian, I, I try to do that in my own humble way. And um, I'm really humbled to be here and make a small contribution to the rich conversations. And thank you to the person on the organising committee who scheduled me after Bruce. I really <laughs> appreciate who just got the standing ovation, I appreciate it. <laughs> um, so um, in, term, in terms of who I am uh, and, and where I come from, I come from the iwi and hapu, the tribes and the sub-tribes uh, of the Waikato, the King Country and uh, the far north regions. I live in Ngāru Wahia, which is about one hour drive south of Tāmaki of Auckland. Um, it's right smack in the heart of the Kingitanga, which is the Māori King movement, uh, which was set up in 1858. Uh, specifically to keep Māori control of Māori lands. Um, I work nearby at the University of Waikato, uh, which is next week hosting the NASA meeting, um, So, which is why there's not many of my colleagues here that are all back home uh, working busily for the conference next week, and hopefully we'll see some of you there. And uh, so I'm a social scientist, and the work that I do at Waikato is at the interface of uh, Māori and Indigenous demographic population research, and uh, Indigenous data sovereignty. And so it's those sort of multiple lenses of who I am and what I do that I, I want to bring to bear uh, on this talk today. So uh, for me as an auntie and a mum, uh, when I think of well-being, of thinking, speaking, and being, I think of uh, the next generation. Oh, there we go. The next generation. These are my kids, uh, my nieces and my nephews. I've just blurred them out here because um, I, I didn't want to get in trouble with their parents for sort of beaming them around the world. But I wanted them um, to be there. And I think about them. It's not just because I love them and I want the best for them. Of course I do. But from a Māori worldview, and I would say an Indigenous worldview, um, our children are precious to us because they are both the embodiment of our ancestors and the future bearers of our collective identity. Um, so they are us, and we are them, and their well-being is our well-being. So in this photo, the tamariki are, are at the homestead of our, my family at a place called Parihaka, uh, where my grandmother was born. So Parihaka was established by the prophets uh, Tuhukaki here in Te Whiti o Rungomai after the devastation caused by the uh, colonial wars and the massive land confiscation that followed. And at one time, it was the largest Māori village in the country. Uh, in 1881, uh, Parihaka was invaded by colonial troops. As a faith-based community committed to nonviolence, uh, the people did not resist. 
So the troops, they plundered and razed the village. Um, they raped a woman. They sent many of the men far away to the South Island as prisoners with no trial. And they forcibly disbanded most of the community. Now, this history was never taught in schools. For the most part, it still isn't, because Aotearoa New Zealand and Māori history is still not a core part of the education curriculum. And, and I know this is not unique to Aotearoa. Knowing our colonial histories is purely voluntary. Living with the intergenerational impacts of it is not. So fast forward nearly 140 years, and here they stand, the great, great, great grandchildren of those ancestors. Uh, we have survived, we're still there, but we want more than that. We want to thrive, and we want to thrive on our own terms, and thriving, on our, thriving as a collective on our own terms is a resounding theme that I've heard at this conference, and it's fundamental to Indigenous wellbeing. As a population uh, researcher, I've spent a lot of time working with iwi, with tribes, and uh, with Māori organisations and communities who want to advance the well-being of their people and who want the data to both reflect and inform uh, their aspirations. And what I've found is that most of these organisations and communities understand really well what well-being means to them and the values that underpin it. But they're unable to access the right data either because it simply doesn't exist, uh, or the barriers to access and use are so prohibitive. I've seen and felt a very real sense of frustration over the ways in which their well-being is statistically represented and misrepresented, and more importantly, how those misrepresentations are then acted on in a very top-down, heavy-handed way with respect to policy interventions. There's also a real failure to connect the local intelligence of tribes and communities and their desire for grounded and devolved action to the larger national policy making agenda. And these issues are really timely now because wellbeing uh, looms large in the political and the policy agenda uh, in Aotearoa. It's an agenda that relies very heavily on data and on the conceptualization of wellbeing, on the collection of data on measurement and monitoring. So in the last month we've had the, you may have heard of it, the wellbeing budget, um, which has an entire budget based on the government's uh, wellbeing priorities. The Treasury now has a living standards framework which is adapted from the OECD Better Lives Index to, and it's seeking to measure uh, national wellbeing beyond the purely economic. Uh, the government is just about to unveil its child and youth wellbeing strategy, which provides a framework to drive uh, government policy and action in that area, and it's underpinned um, by this really sort of ambitious vision of New Zealand being the best country in the world to be a child. But we know for too many Māori children, Aotearoa is far from being the best place to be a child. We are overrepresented on all the usual negative indicators of ill-being, and all too often the blame is squarely attributed uh, to parents, to families and communities. The removal of Māori babies and children from their mothers and families is a massive issue. Just last week, an open letter was issued to the New Zealand government calling for them to stop stealing Māori children. And I know this will resonate deeply with many of you here. So all too often, Māori have found ourselves as a problem to be solved, the ones to be intervened upon, not the ones with the solutions. From where I stand, there's a huge potential for these wellbeing initiatives to deliver significantly for Māori, and I do applaud the Prime Minister's uh, courageous vision. But the opportunities to transform and really transform the status quo uh, will be missed unless government commits to addressing and identifying the systemic and institutionalised forms of racism uh, that are part and parcel of ongoing colonialism, like Bruce talked about, uh, that produces and reproduces ill-being. And they will be missed too, I think, if Māori are not front and centre, like we heard earlier this morning, of defining what well-being looks like for us and deciding the pathways and the actions to get there and to stay there. So um, I just want to change text a little bit now and, and talk about, a little, dig a little bit deeper into the uh, concepts of indigenous well-being and colonisation and colonialism and how that features in some of the research that we've been doing recently. Um, so we've heard in various talks about how well-being is deeply contextual and in some ways community-specific, 
and uh, the Yaru Mabulian uh, wellbeing framework that Peter Yu talked about yesterday is a really powerful um, example of that. But are there also broad uh, shared elements of indigenous wellbeing that we're able to identify beyond the local? And if so, what might those shared elements of indigenous wellbeing look like? Um, so this was a question that we explored as part of research that was funded by the Māori Centre of Research Excellence, uh, Ngāpai o Te Marmatanga, and it was part of a large project um, led by Linda Smith, uh, who wrote a little obscure book called uh, Decolonising Methodologies. Um, that's a joke, huge book, huge book, Decolonising Methodologies. So uh, we did a semi-structured review of the literature relating to indigenous wellbeing um, at the global level, like at the UN, WHO, uh, in select countries in all, the, all of the world's regions and in Aotearoa. And we ranked the articles for relevance and analysed common themes uh, across levels and contexts. And what we came out was actually pretty simple. Um, so the first element of indigenous wellbeing that we identified was a concept of freedom, uh, which relates to autonomy, uh, to justice, to rights as first people, <clears throat> to sovereignty and self-determination. Uh, the second theme, if we move across there, was balance. Um, this was the balance or harmony between people and nature of sustainable ecosystems, of the balance between the spiritual and the physical worlds, the balance between individuals and collectives of personhood and peoplehood. The third element uh, that we identified was a theme about surviving and thriving. It's about moving literally, literally from demographic survival to thriving families and communities, to having good health and a good quality of life. And uh, the last, element was around distinctive identity. It was about language and culture, knowledge, lifeways and institutions. And I think I've heard all of these elements being talked about in the uh, opening dresses yesterday, yesterday morning, just in one morning, these elements were all talked about. Um, in a similar sort of macro approach and working with my colleague Pierre Axelsson at uh, Umeå University in Sweden, um, we undertook another research project trying to understand how colonization and colonialism was conceptualized in the literature pertaining to indigenous health, and particularly that using uh, statistical or quantitative evidence. Um, and that was a project funded by the Swedish Research Council. We asked the questions, to what extent is colonization or colonialism treated as a driver or a, a deep underlying cause of indigenous health? Um, how is it conceptualized? And what are the sort of direct and indirect mechanisms linking colonization and colonialism to indigenous health? <clears throat> what we found was that in the vast majority of papers, colonization was not even mentioned. It was irrelevant and thus rendered invisible. Uh, that's the bottom, the bottom row. For the papers that did refer to colonization, more often than not, it was mentioned briefly or in passing as a sort of context setting variable, as a, as a past event in the way that Bruce talked about. So colonization was seen as a historical process of settlement or of dispossession and displacement. And the mechanisms of leading this past event to historical indigenous health outcomes was demographic swamping and disease. And in the case of contemporary health outcomes, these past events were seen to produce uh, dislocated relationships between indigenous peoples and their lands and to each other, typically in relation to mental health. And for a real minority of the literature, uh, colonization and colonialism was treated as a deep underlying structural driver of indigenous health and conceptualized in terms of cultural disruption, a loss of political autonomy, dominance, and loss of an economic base and autonomy. And the mechanisms linking uh, colonization and colonialism as an ongoing process were uh, assimilation policy, policies that suppress and compromise culture and identity, uh, intergenerational trauma, racism, exclusion, discrimination, and cumulative disadvantage. I haven't included there the list of uh, health indicators, but in the literature that we looked at, it covered a wide range of health outcomes. Um, perhaps unsurprisingly, the clearest articulations of the links between colonization and colonialism and indigenous health was from indigenous researchers and um, indigenous health um, research groups. People like Ian Anderson, Malcolm Reed, um, Malcolm King, Paparangi Reed, Bridget Robson, Ricky Harris, Karina Walters, and more. Your name, the names will be uh, familiar to you. 
Um, so for me, <clears throat> I guess there were two sort of take-home messages from those exercises. Um, one, that while colonisation is intimately kind of intertwined with well-being, or the absence thereof, it's still largely invisible and amorphous as an underlying determinant that has intermediate and proximate uh, manifestations, and that articulating those linkages is hard but very necessary. Um, and two, that indigenous researchers are the ones best positioned and equipped to make those connections and to make those visible. <clears throat> so um, I mentioned at the start um, that uh, what I do is at the nexus of population, uh, the, the work, the research that I do, most of it is at the nexus of population research and indigenous data sovereignty. Um, I was really, you know, when I was listening to you speak, uh, Bruce, it was so clear that you're so passionate and committed to the work that you do and understand, so knowledgeable about it. Um, and we love the work that we do because we think it makes a difference. Um, one of the things that I love about uh, population level analysis is that it enables us to identify and track large scale and long term patterns and trends. Well, not 60,000 years of long term patterns and trends, but um, in, a very, in, a, in, a, in the more recent um, distant past. Uh, so, changes in fertility and family formation and family structure. Um, it's all of the big picture stuff that helps us understand how our society is changing and, in turn, how our lives are changing. And it provides a sort of analytical tools uh, to help us identify and grapple with some of the uh, underlying drivers and the consequences, consequences um, of those changes. Um, so for me, uh, demography, it sounds really dry and boring, and it can be a lot of the time, but um, for me it's much more than data points and population pyramids and lines on a graphs. Uh, it's about the rich stories that lie beneath them. It's the stories of the people who comprise the populations that really matters. So um, the green line there represents the changes in the number of Māori as enumerated in the population census, and this is the axis here from 100,000 to 700,000. And it traces the severe population decline that Māori experienced uh, following the 1840 Treaty of Waitangi to the very low point of less than 42,000 in the 1986 census. It's, you can't really see the scale of decline there because of the axis here. <coughs> Um, so these were the decades in which uh, European settlers um, prepared to, quote, smooth the dying um, Apollo of the Māori race. That's a very famous quote. I'm sure you'll have analogous ones here as well. They seem to exist in all the colonial settler states. Um, and then we see a gradual uh, recuperation um, and high rates of population growth as life expectation improved and fertility rates reached historic highs uh, in the 1940s and the 1950s. And then the population continued to grow at a strong, albeit slowing rate. <clears throat> Once the Māori fertility decline got underway from the late 1960s, it was one of the most dramatic fertility declines seen in any population, uh, except subsequently in uh, Iran and, and Thailand. Um, the 2013 census is the, one, the most recent one for which we have Māori data. And it counted uh, just under 600,000 Māori on the basis of ethnicity, which is cultural affiliation, and 670,000 on the basis of descent. Uh, and it's been, by all accounts, a spectacular story of uh, kind of back from the brink. The red line here shows Māori as a percentage of the total population, uh, and the axis here is on the right-hand side, so from 10% or well, from 60% down to 10 by the first Māori census in 1858, Māori comprised about half of the population, but by the turn of the century had plummeted just to 5%. So the rapid growth of the European settler population through high rates of in-migration was key to this changing population balance, and it depended utterly on the alienation and confiscation of Māori land. So this is a distinctive feature of the demography of indigenous, indigenous peoples and in all the colonised uh, settler states. It's the double whammy of becoming marginalised minorities in our own ham, homelands in a very short space of time and experiencing dramatic population decline. So that's a demographic double whammy. But beneath these numbers lies a whole set of uh, complex relationships and stories. Stories about the impacts of disease on kinship lines and structures, loss of political autonomy, land theft, enduring intergenerational poverty, policies of assimilation and institutional and interpersonal forms of racism and discrimination. 
But these stories are also stories of incredible strength and resilience, of adaptation, of innovation, of resistance, of determination and reconnection. So our demographic histories are so much richer uh, than a set of time series data points on a graph. Um, and in recent years, I've moved away from a focus on using uh, data to tell stories to the analysis of the production and the ethics of data use. Uh, it's a new and it's a fascinating area for me, um, not the least of which is because of the huge change that's occurred in the last decade. So technological innovation has transformed uh, both the ways in which data are collected, and um, shared and integrated and accessed, um, and the ways in which data are analysed, for example, uh, with the, machine, uh, the development of machine learning. But we live in an age where data is everywhere now, and the volume of data is growing at an exponential rate, particularly in the health sector. But in the 21st century, the power to um, decide whether and how Indigenous people are counted classified, analysed and acted upon continues to lie with governments and increasingly with big business, with multinational corporations. And so transforming the locus of power over Indigenous data from the nation state back to Indigenous peoples really lies at the heart of this idea of Indigenous data sovereignty and I just want to talk uh, a little bit about that now. So in 2016, uh, I co-edited uh, with my Australian colleague this book on Indigenous data sovereignty towards an agenda, uh, the John Taylor. And uh, <clears throat> the stunning artwork here comes from um, a collaboration between a First Nations artist, um, uh, Preston Singletary, and a Rotorua-based artist, Lewis Tamihana Gardner. I think it's a really powerful image. It's, it's kind of about collaborating to move forward into uncharted waters from a position of strength. Um, the book's freely available on the uh, ANU website, and um, it contains chapters by um, my friend and colleague, uh, Maggie Walter, uh, Ray Lovett, who's here, I think, Megan Davis, and uh, Eunice Yu, who's uh, Peter's sister, and Mandy Yap. <clears throat> so the basic premise of the book is that uh, Indigenous peoples have inherent and inalienable rights relating to the collection, the ownership, the application of data about us, about our lifeways, and about our territories and it theorises these rights and interests, and it asks the questions, what does data sovereignty mean for Indigenous peoples, and how is it being used in the pursuit of our self-determination? And within those kind of two larger questions, the smaller ones like, who owns or stewards the data? Who decides what kinds of data are collected and how it gets used? And how do Indigenous communities actually benefit from the data, and what are the risks involved? Um, and these Questions are pretty timely uh, in Aotearoa at the moment, uh, given the changes that are occurring in the wake of the 2018 census, which had much, much lower participation rates than usual, and now the National Statistics Agency, Stats New Zealand, is turning to the use of other government data to plug the census data gaps, and Māori and Pacific peoples are disproportionately affected because we're the ones with the highest non-response rates. So the norms and expectations about what the census actually entails are being redefined in ways that many New Zealanders and certainly most Māori are not aware of. So I think we're in for some really uh, interesting conversations in the coming months. <clears throat> about the same time as that book was in train, myself and a group of other um, Māori data lovers, and it is a thing, um, established the uh, Māori Data Sovereignty Network, uh, Te Mana Raraunga, um, so it now brings together about 100 Māori researchers, practitioners and entrepreneurs across the research, IT, uh, tribal community and NGO sectors. And um, it's got one key purpose, and that is to advocate for Māori rights and interests in data and for the development of Māori, tribal and hapū data infrastructure and capability. Uh, so you can go to the website uh, and it's all there. Uh, one of the things that uh, Te Mana Raraunga has done is to produce a range of practical resources, including Māori data sovereignty principles, which uh, you can download from their TMR website. Um, so just so we're clear in terms of kind of definitions, when I'm talking about Māori data, I'm talking about information or knowledge in a digital or digitizable form that is about or from Māori people, our environments and culture regardless of who controls it. So it doesn't have to be controlled by Māori for it to be Māori data. And the data sovereignty refers to the inherent rights and interests that we have in relation to the collection, the ownership and the application of our Māori data. And the Māori data governance 
as the principles, uh, the structures, the accountability mechanisms, the legal instruments and the policies through which we can exercise control over our data. And it's important to note here that the principles are to guide the ethical use of data to enhance the well-being of our people, our language, uh, and our culture. So it's underpinned by, oh, don't see me go, there we go. It's underpinned by, um, <clears throat> the principles are under, underpinned by six Māori values. Uh, the one shown here is rangatiratanga, or authority, and that's the value um, of, of which translates into three specific principles uh, relating to data control, uh, data jurisdiction, and data self-determination. I don't uh, have the time to go into the kind of nuts and bolts of it there, but it's on the TMR website if you're interested in looking at what the data uh, sovereignty principles are about. Now, while this concept of data sovereignty is, is the product of a digital age, the concept of having collective control is not a recent creation. So uh, Māori, like other indigenous peoples, have long been data gatherers and genealogies and carvings and songs and chants. Um, and there's long been rights and responsibilities concerning the use of this community-held information. Uh, knowledge belonged to the collective, not to the individual, and it was fundamental uh, to identity. So you won't be able to see the detail there, and it's okay. I just want to graphically kind of show it. Um, now, much of our research and kind of network activity in the last couple of years since the book has really been uh, in and around making the arguments about what Māori data sovereignty is and why it matters, and doing lots of outreach to our communities who want the data and to the government who control so much of it. Um, there's been a huge amount of interest in uh, data sovereignty and data governance, and the ideas seem to have travelled far and wide. Um, but like Bruce said, um, enthusiasm is one thing and substantive change is another. And we're still a long way off having a data ecosystem that really meets our needs. And trying to change government systems is a long game. And we're impatient. Um, so we're trying to move into like the next stage of data sovereignty, which is how to operationalize it. So we've been build, trying to um, build the foundational parts of an ecosystem has been the recent focus of a group of Māori researchers um, and practitioners, most of who are involved in TMR network. And this is what we're currently working on, which we're hoping to get funded through a Ministry of uh, Business, Employment and Innovation Data Science Investment Fund. And we'll be competing with every other data scientist in the country. Um, so it's going to be tough. But there's uh, three main themes. One is data sovereignty, one is data science, and one is data capability. And in the data sovereignty theme, um, we've got a bunch of projects there <coughs> relating to tikanga, which is protocols and technology, so it's the embeddingness of our customary protocols inside the uh, technology, uh, data classification, Māori data provenance, decolonising algorithms, so how do we uh, create our own culturally sensitive algorithms as they're applied to our data to model our outcomes. We want to be the architects of that, not the passive recipients. Um, in the data science thing, we have projects related to Māori artificial intelligence, natural language processing of the Māori language, and new methods for modelling outcomes in Māori communities. In the data capability stream, we have a suite of initiatives designed to build uh, homegrown data warriors um, in our communities, in the research community, and in our institutions. And we designed it in this way because we think if we get some of these fundamentals right, we'll be a little bit closer to activating a Māori data sovereignty data ecosystem. And it will also, we believe, bring wider benefits for New Zealanders generally. Um, I just want to finish up now by talking about a bit of work I've been doing with my own people, Ngāti Tipa. Um, and it brings together these um, threads of colonisation, and wellbeing and demography and indigenous data sovereignty. Um, so the project's funded by the Marsden Fund and it's focused on measuring and understanding the impacts of colonisation on the population health of my people Ngāti Tipa in the 19th and early 20th century. One of the big challenges of doing this sort of historical demography in Aotearoa is the reliance on secondary data like published census figures. And we don't have these readily assembled large uh, data sets that enable us to directly observe kind of patterns of mortality. In other countries like Sweden and Canada and the US and UK, uh, researchers have constituted populations themselves using uh, records such as church registries and census records. 
and it allows them to identify and analyse these changing patterns of uh, fertility and mortality and migration and population growth. We have nothing like that in Aotearoa. Uh, so this project borrows from the idea of population reconstitution to reconstruct our 19th century generations of Ngāti Tipa ancestors and to create our own tribally controlled genealogical databases, but um, it does it in a really different way. Um, and uh, at the heart of it is the data that actually matters the most to us, which is our data about uh, whakapapa and whenua. So that's our kinship, uh, our genealogies, and our land, um, and bringing those two together. So um, I'm just one person in a, in a whole range of uh, people working on this research. Um, many hands make light work, and um, so we've got here our, our oral historian here, uh, Nebia Mahuika, who's just written a fantastic uh, paper that's available for free on a journal online called Genealogies, and it's a special issue on uh, indigenous perspectives and worldviews uh, in relation to genealogical research. Um, we've got our local person here, Nikani, who's from Ngāti Tipa and lives in our, home, in our homeland. Um, an elder and genealogy expert here, Karu Kukutai, who um, happens to be my father. I never, thought I, I never thought I'd be working with my father, it's crazy. Um, <clears throat> it's, but it's the highlight of my research uh, career. I've learned so much from him um, in ways that I really never anticipated. Um, someone very wise, um, uh, well-respected indigenous researcher said, I said, can you give me some advice on what I should do as I was just uh, graduated with my PhD um, in Indigenous research? She goes, yeah, never work with your family. <laughs> I thank a few when I'm doing this, but it's all worked out really well. Um, and we also have an, a Māori archaeologist and GIS technician. Uh, one of my cousins, Vanessa Clark, who's a technologist who spent about a decade in the Silicon Valley uh, managing projects for Cisco. Um, our only uh, uh, non-Indigenous person in our research team um, who, in a sort of stereotype confirming way, is our Bayesian statistician. <laughs> and uh, he used to run the population projections for Sats New Zealand, so he really knows the stuff. And, um, and then we have another one of our local women um, who's also doing her masters on one of her ancestors. So um, <clears throat> this is a map from around 1866, and it shows the Opuatia block that was um, allocated to Angati Tipa Rangatira, or Chief Wata Kukutai. Um, by the compensation court that was set up after the massive confiscation of Waikato lands through the New Zealand Settlements Act. Um, so some 45,000 acres were returned uh, to our tribe, Ngāti Tipa, but by the turn of the century, much of it had been alienated through stealth and other measures, and only a fragment of that land actually remains um, in our ownership. Uh, so just to give you a sense of what um, our land looks like, <clears throat> And there's a picture of my oldest daughter on the, the small part of the Opuatia block um, that we're f fortunate to still have in our family. And as you can see, it's quite lush. Uh, it's actually one of the most fertile areas in the whole country, and it's known as a horticulture hub. Because it's on the southern edge of Auckland, um, which has one of the most unaffordable property markets in the whole world, um, it's coming under increasing pressure from property developers and um, that's only going to intensify in coming years. So she knows uh, that her job is mo tonu, mo tonu te whenua, keep hold of the land, don't let it go. So uh, this is just a bit of an excerpt from um, the 1844 census that the missionary Monsal created. Uh, so the construction of our genealogical databases starts with these two kind of censuses or lists undertaken in 1844 and 1858 for 11 Waikato tribes, and we were one of them. So the first list was compiled by uh, the missionary uh, Robert Maunsell, and it listed the names, you don't have to see the detail, it doesn't matter, listed the names of 216 uh, Ngāti men, women, and children. Um, and then the list also connects the women to their men, and the children to their mothers. Um, so in 1858, 14 years later, a man came along called um, Francis Fetton. He was the colonial resident magistrate in the area, and he later became the chief judge of the Native Land Court, which was also an instrument for land alienation. And he tried to repeat the missionary census, and he tried to account for the number in each tribe that has subsequently died or moved, those who had moved back, those who had changed names between 1844 and 1858, um, 
those who were uh, born between 1844 and 58, and those who had changed names. So they've got uh, two lists there, one uh, original name in 1844, and then a name change in 1858. And so that 1858 list um, had 189 Ngāti Tipa men, women and children. So these lists are not perfect by any means. We've all poured over them. There's heaps of mistakes. There's people there who shouldn't be there. They miss some people who should be there. They match the wrong women with the wrong men, the wrong children with the wrong parents. There's heaps of typos. But treated with due care and diligence, it is an amazing resource for us that most tribes lack. And what I really like about this is that we're able to turn an instrument that was actually intended for colonial surveillance on its head and repurpose it for our own needs. So um, we also have an extent, these are the two, so these two sources form uh, kind of the, the PO of our genealogical database. Uh, we also have a very extensive 1868 genealogy that was given by one of our ancestors in the Compensation Court, Tūtirangianini uh, um, Kukutai. <coughs> and this list here also contains many of the adults and the children from the census, and taken together, these three sources... Oh, what's happening with my animations? It's going a bit crazy. These three sources, which are all publicly available, actually, form the foundations of our genealogical database. So from here, we're integrating material from historical newspapers, um, Māori land court minutes and books, block files which contains a list of owners and successions. We have hundreds of maps and survey plans. Um, we have stacks of files from archives and libraries, um, births, deaths and marriage records, photographs. It's all a bit delayed here with this. This is the trouble when you put too many animations on one slide. Um, registrations, photographs, and even uh, information um, from our headstones and our traditional uh, burial grounds. Um, most importantly, our families developed um, with our historian, Nipu uh, Mahuika, um, a by whānau, for whānau approach. So it's a by family, for family approach um, for capturing the stories of our elders. And so for the past year, uh, my dad, Karu Kukutai, who's 17, 79 himself, but young by the elders' standards, him and Henny, who lives at home, they go out and they talk to our, our elders, and they sit with them in their homes, um, and they talk to them about the stories that have been passed down through the generations, and they capture this digitally. So they ask questions like, who are the important ancestors that you recall, and why were they significant? What were the traits of these ancestors? Because we believe that our traits of our ancestors actually get passed down through our children. What were the sites of significance and what are the stories that actually go with those sites of significance? So this has ended up being um, a really significant exercise in, in data repatriation and digitization and integration on a scale that actually I never really thought of and imagined when we started doing this project. And it's involved taking these fragments of us from the public repositories and bringing it back into our own space to make sense of it under our own protocols. Um, and we're really creating a methodology as we go because it doesn't exist. So what we're doing is focusing on the primary sources in the public repositories. We locate and digitize it. Or if the material is already digitized, we just get a copy of it. All the files are labelled to retain the provenance information, and then depending on the type and the content, we transcribe it or we index key terms. Um, there's still so much to do there. That, that part of it kind of feels like a lifetime's work. Um, when the source contains direct genealogical information, like the name of an ancestor, a residence, or a date of death, we add that to the genealogical database, which we're currently using an off-the-shelf uh, design, but we're trying to... Uh, we're, uh, we're talking to other data scientists so that we can create our own genealogical database, which is conceptually driven by our own concepts of kinship. So we haven't yet integrated all this data. Um, that's ongoing, but we've certainly got a strong platform to work with. Um, unlike the projects that I noted before, this is not um, demography from the desktop. It's not done from the safety of the, and the distance of a desktop using uh, secondary sources. The data belong to the people, so we take it back to the people. And we hold regular genealogical gatherings at our traditional marae, which is our traditional meeting places. And our approach has been to pull all these fragments of information into genealogical charts, and we print them out, so we don't go there with a database, we print them out into physical charts, and they become the focus of our meetings. And my dad, uh, who's pictured here, you can see he's having a great old time. He has these, he, 
he's so old school, so he prints it all out, then he gets a sellotape, and he sellotapes all the bits of paper together, and it ends up being about 20 pages long, and my kids call them the Dead Sea Scrolls. Well, actually, we call them the Dead Sea Scrolls, but now they call them the Dead Sea Scrolls as well. Um, and so we have these, um, these gatherings on our marae, and um, my dad's been absolutely critical. His mātauranga, his traditional knowledge, has been absolutely critical for this project. Um, and it's a really powerful example of how that traditional knowledge trumps Western scientific methods in the data that means the most to us. Um, and he's critical because he helps put the information in its proper context. And I've learned so much from him, uh, and I'll be forever grateful for him. So this is where the mātauranga, the knowledge of our people, becomes really important. So we have uh, kōrero or uh, yarning um, about the origins of our names. Um, about the impact of Christianity, Christianity on our names, about the ceremonies that our ancestors um, undertook to cleanse the land, about our marriage alliances within our tribe and our relationships with other tribes and sub-tribes. So that's all the stuff that we talk about. It's not just about a list of names. Um, and this information is recorded and the charts are updated uh, until the next gathering and then we hand them out again. So the methodology has been to give over the information. It hasn't been to take it and hoard it for ourselves. But now families are coming forward with their own genealogies um, and they want to hand it over to the project and they're participating in interviews. And this information requires active protection and the integration of protocols uh, with the technology. So ultimately, where we want to get to is a, is a digital pā harakeke, um, a digital archive. Um, and this will be a cloud-based Ngāti Tipa digital archive. And our strategy has been led by one of our cousins, Vanessa, who, like I said, is a technologist. Uh, but more importantly, she's able to translate that into a community context in a way that our aunties and um, our elders and our children can actually understand. So the approach she's designed can be um, likened to a pāharakeke, which is a flax garden, and it grows in clusters. And the clusters are our families from Ngāti Tipa who descend from the various um, ancestral lines, and they all link us back to our eponymous ancestor, Tipa, from who we take our name. That's about 11 generations back from me. Um, so at the bottom, there's a digital layer here. Um, and this is where the data is. This is the data that sits there. So it's genealogical, land, photos, interviewing, songs, a whole bunch of multimedia data. That's the bottom layer. Um, and the layer above that, that's the tikanga, or the, the pātaka, the storehouse, um, that's really the physical container for the data. Um, and in line with Māori data sovereignty principles, we want to ensure that our server is actually located on our lands, that it's not offshore. Um, so we're working to try and develop that. The third one is the tikanga. That's really the access permissions, the access and use permissions to access the data. And our whānau are actually determining uh, what that access and use permissions looks like. Um, and then the final layer, the top of that, is the application's web base. And that is, um, uh, it's going to be a cloud-based portal. Um, more than one-fifth of Māori actually don't even live in Aotearoa. So we have to be realistic and make it a, a place where our um, tamariki and the rest of Ngāti Tepe can actually connect with the resources that belong to them, um, rather than hoarding it away. So uh, that's kind of where we're going to. and. Um, in line with the kind of data sovereignty principles, this is not a university-owned project. It's actually owned by the tribe um, and will be controlled by them in future generations. So in terms of the statistical modelling, that's going to continue. That's actually the easy part, and it's actually the very small part. But in terms of the actual archive itself, um, what we really want to do is to try and create uh, infrastructure that's sustainable so that it will last beyond one research project. We also need succession planning to ensure um, that the stewardship of our data treasures and resources is genuinely intergenerational. Um, and we want to create the pathways in to connect because it's what's become evident from this project is it's our kinship connections are our strength. Um, and so uh, I began this talk um, with talking about our tamariki and our children um, and our next generation. And I just want to kind of close the loop uh, by acknowledging uh, our Ngāti Tipa elders who lent their time and their wisdom uh, with humour and uh, the utmost generosity um, and uh, whose contributions will endure. Uh, thank you.